Hello, good evening. Thank you all for joining us um, this evening. My name is Tammy Navarro, and I'm the Associate Director of the Barnard Center for Research on Women. Um, I'd like to begin tonight's event, as we often do, um, with a word of thanks to those whose labor made it possible for us to be here, particularly the staff at BCRW, um, including Pam Phillips, Hope Dector, Avi Cummings, Eve Couch, and BCRW's director, Elizabeth Castelli, right here in the back row. I would also like to thank our research assistants who are here with us this evening working, Helen Xiang, who's live streaming, Zaira Speller, who has our merchandise over at the table, and Tirza Anderson, who likely clicked you in, um, for their work this evening. To say it's a pleasure to engage with tonight's speakers is an understatement. Through their work, they have each made vital contributions to scholarship, archival engagement, and art that examines the ongoing relationship and connections between Denmark and its former Caribbean colony, the islands today known as the United States Virgin Islands. Some of you may recall that last year, Barnard professor Monica Miller, who's also here, and I, because we brought them, uh, we brought several artists, including LaVon Bell, to campus to share their work in a series of events that took place under the heading of Black Imaginary Scandinavian Diasporas. This evening's conversation is an opportunity for us to revisit these conversations in some ways, dwelling particularly upon Denmark's engagement with blackness and its black former subjects in the Caribbean. Two years ago, the speakers on this panel and I all found ourselves together in Copenhagen to celebrate the premiere of Hellestinum's documentary, We Carry It Within Us, Fragments of a Shared Colonial Past. The timing of this film's release was significant as the year 2017 marked the 100-year anniversary of the sale of the Danish West Indies to the United States and the transformation of these islands into the United States Virgin Islands. The occasion of this centennial produced many different responses, both in Denmark and in the United States, some celebration, much education, and for those of us on stage this evening, the real beginning of a transnational collaborative project, series of projects really, that engage both this historic moment of the centennial and Denmark's long presence in the Caribbean. Among the projects originating in Denmark was a large-scale digitization and translation of archival records that were previously unavailable or inaccessible to many in the Virgin Islands. While this digitization marked an important shift in Denmark's engagement with its own archive, it remains imperfect as issues of language, access, and context continue to limit a robust engagement with this material in the Virgin Islands, limitations that the speakers on this panel will outline as they discuss their own work. So as a moderator of tonight's conversation, I will now briefly introduce each speaker, after which they'll each speak for 15 minutes or so. I'm told the or so is significant, or so. <laughs> uh, after this, we'll have a moderated conversation, and then we invite the audience to join the conversation um, in the Q&A. So without further ado, let me tell you about tonight's speakers, and they'll be presenting in the order in which they're seated. Helestina is a filmmaker and a lecturer in the Department of Communication and Arts at Roskilde University. Her research interests include marginalized migrants and migrant illegality, whiteness in gender and memory, and silence about the Nordic colonial past, as well as the decolonization of colonial archives. Her documentary work includes the film, We Carry It Within Us, Fragments of a Shared Colonial Past, which Tiffany, Lavon, and I had the privilege of participating in. And she is currently working on three documentaries, including one on The Camp, which focuses on past and current return refugee camps in Denmark. In addition to her academic work and documentary filmmaking, Hella is also an activist and is the organizer and founder of the Fireburn Files Project, an initiative which aims to facilitate the creation of a shared web-based platform of accessible historical sources on the 1878 Fireburn Labor Rebellion on St. Croix. Lavon Bell, makes visible the unremembered. Borrowing from elements of architecture, history, and archeology, span Bell creates narratives that challenge, the, that challenge colonial hierarchies and invisibility. She explores the material culture of coloniality, and her work presents counter visualities and narratives. 
Working in a variety of disciplines, her practice includes painting, installation, photography, video, and public interventions. Her work with colonial era pottery led to a commission with the renowned brand of porcelain products, the Royal Copenhagen. She has exhibited her work in the Caribbean, the United States, and Europe. She is the co-creator of I Am Queen Mary, the artist-led groundbreaking monument that confronted Danish colonial amnesia while commemorating the legacies of resistance of the African people who were brought to the former Danish West Indies. And this is what you see on the poster is an image of I Am Queen Mary. Levon is currently a finalist for the Inequality in Bronze project in Philadelphia to redesign one of the first monuments to an enslaved woman at the Stenton House Historic Museum. As a current fellow at the Social Justice Institute right here at BCRW, she is working on a project about influential Virgin Islanders in the Harlem Re Renaissance, and her studio is based in the Virgin Islands. Last but absolutely not least, Tiffany Yannick is the author of the poetry collection Wife, which won the 2016 Bocas Prize in Caribbean Poetry and the United Kingdom's 2016 Forward Felix Dennis Prize for a first collection. Tiffany is also the author of the novel Land of Love and Drowning, which won the 2014 Flaherty Dunnan First Novel Award from the Center for Fiction, the Phyllis Wheatley Award for Pan-African Literature, and the American Academy of Arts and Letters Rosenthal Family Foundation Award. Land of Love and Drowning was also a finalist for the Orion Award in Envi Environmental Literature and the Hurston Wright Legacy Award. She's also the author of a collection of stories, How to Escape from a Leper Colony, which won her a listing as one of the National Book Foundation's Five Under 35. Her writing has also won the Bocas Award for Caribbean Fiction, the Boston Review Prize in Fiction, a Rona Jaffe Foundation Writer's Award, a Pushcart Prize, a Fulbright Scholarship, and an Academy of American Poets Prize. Tiffany is from the Virgin Islands and is currently visiting associate professor at Emory University. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. Thank you very much, um, Tammy, for this um, invitation and um, the very um, sweet words uh, for, of, of introduction. Um, I will, in my presentation, talk about two things. Um, and I think, um, well, kind of, for me, it, it's, it's kind of, 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 of new stories, maybe not for you, but it's, it's, um, it's two kinds of intervention into the Danish colonial archives. It's about um, the sculpture Freedom that a few hours ago was inaugurated in uh, Copenhagen, and the other kind of intervention is uh, on the uh, Fiber and Files project. And I guess I got a little carried away with the, uh, the freedom sculpture today. So um, I'll try to, to shorten my presentation a little bit. I can see I have a lot. Um, so this is, this is um, my photographer who sent some um, photos from the uh, inauguration of freedom. And this is the Minister of Culture making a speech. And this is the sculpture um, freedom. It was created by the Ghanaian American artist, Bright Bim Pong, and donated by a group of people from the US Virgin Islands, uh, arrived and was displayed for the first time in Copenhagen on transfer day the 31st of March, 2017. The sculpture depicts an Afro-Caribbean man leaning backwards with his eyes closed, a sugar knife raised above his head in one hand and a conch shell in the other, ready to blow the cyclone of resistance and emancipation. The sculpture is a copy of similar sculptures on St. Croix, St. Thomas, and St. John, that since 1998 have commemorated the 150th anniversary of the abolition of slavery in the former Danish colony. The Danish public space of coloniality and postcoloniality had, up until the arrival of the sculpture of freedom, uh, been characterized by the absence of of any monuments explicitly referring to the colonial past, which of course is not the same as absence of monuments and places referring, though unmarked, to colonial dominance and wealth. 
So the, the nomadic sculpture or the transatlantic multi-present sculpture crossed the Atlantic and arrived in, Den in Denmark with a tour plan, but no permanent place in the space of the former colonial power. But today, it finally happened. Freedom was inaugurated and placed uh, permanently and rather discreetly outside the Ministry of Foreign Affairs um, <laughs> at the harbor front in the neighborhood of shipbuilding and sugar refineries in colonial times, two and a half years since it arrived in Denmark. At the inauguration, the Minister of Cultural Affairs expressed her and the nation's sentiments as, well, our Danish history includes bright as well as dark chapters. We shouldn't hide from our own history, nor should we do so when it comes to the most shameful chapters. In my documentary, We Carry It Within Us, which premiered uh, in, in 2017, the sculpture Freedom, together with other bronze sculptures depicting Virgin Islanders who resisted Danish colonial dominance, framed the film, and Freedom plays also um, a role in my new documentary, with the working title, Black Bodies in Bronze, on bronze sculptures in Denmark and the US, representing non-white interventions into public space. In a way, the inauguration of a sculpture represents a kind of institutional closure of the two th 2017 uh, centennial, commemorating the Danish sale of its colony, Dansk West Indian, to the US. And it also sparks reflections on whether a recreation or re-narration of of the Danish colonial history actually came out as a result of the commemorative um, activities. Where are we now in Denmark with our national, where are we now in Denmark with our national imagination on our colonial history? Did we re-narrate the story about the good white colonizer Peter von Scholten? And how do we engage you know, the archival record of the Danish colonial rule? <coughs> Symbolizing um, resistance, an agency among the enslaved African Caribbeans, the sculpture freedom was originally revealed on em Emancipation Day, 3rd of July, 1998, at Frederick's Fort uh, in Frederickstedt on St. Croix. Here, it had been a tradition for many years in the local community to reenact the, the history of emancipation and point out a white person to perform the role of the suppressor the governor, Peter von Schalten, being overthrown and defeated. Reparation for the sufferings of enslavement was prior to uh, 1998, an ongoing debate in the Caribbean as well as in the US and in the US Virgin Island. But at this special event in 1998, Denmark sent the message by the Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Ms. Hilvi Peterson, that no apology for the past atrocities was in the horizon and that he did not see any point in persons not personally involved in slave trade apologizing to persons who were not victims hereof. Denmark also sent a gift to the event clearly based on the national imagination of the governor von Schalten as the good colonial ruler giving the enslaved people their freedom. An imagination created and maintained for decades through national history, museums, and popular fiction, shaping very effectively the collective memory of the national Danish us as caring colonial masters. An actor, Kurt Raun, was hired to reenact the government, uh, governor Peter von Schalten with a song and the line, you are now emancipated. The unapologetic colonial master returning to the colonies with his, this dis distorted perception of the shared past was so provocative that the event turned into a slight unrest. Um, the repeated national narrative on uh, Peter von Schalten as a good colonial uh, governor can be seen as a conscious or unconscious strategic answer directed towards removal of unrest and um, the anticipated and potential discomfort of engaging from a white privileged European position with the colonial past. 
on uh, its journey to Denmark for the 2017 centennial commemoration, the sculpture Freedom carried this context of creation, narrative of resistance and conflicting Im uh, imaginations and memories. Commemoration points in the direction of remembering together, but is that possible? Looking back on 2017, no one in Denmark opposed or criticized freedom um, or the gesture of giving freedom as a gift to remember. As the sculpture was appreciated, celebrated, displayed in the media, in important context and institutional buildings, causing remarks and statements on the dark colonial past, <clears throat> it could at first glance seems, uh, seem as a rather unproblematic and smooth incorporation into the national collective memory of an awareness about the colonial crime against humanity. Um, I'll just skip a lip. Um, freedom was, was uh, well, the first key exhibition space for freedom was, uh, as I mentioned, the transfer day of um, 31st of March, 2017. There were West Indian days, days at the town hall in Copenhagen, a weekend with open lectures, film screenings, performances, student exhibitions, etc. Freedom was placed at the center of the huge inner town hall courtyard, decorated with Danish flags, hanging from poles fixed to the top balconies and was hidden beneath a ceremonial white cloth while the audience listened to the mayor of culture, Carl Christian Ebersen, giving his speech to open the West Indian days and reveal freedom. So here he is in action. And what did he say? He, say, well, he said, here at the town hall, it is possible to learn more about the dark chapters, the dark chapters, we have a chapter again, um, of the Danish colonial past. So let us use the centennial to take the past and our common history and bring it into the present and the future. And in an earlier interview, uh, when Freedom arrived in Denmark, he had advocated for a prominent, permanent public location where many people would pass by. I think it's a good idea, not least because it is a black stain on our history. Characteristic for political and institutional imagination in 2017, on the colonial past, the mayor uses a practical and still protective commemoration versionized the language of a black chapter and a black stain in a common history and uses time and distance in order to separate responsibility of past atrocities from current Danish present and future. Black chapter and black chain create the stain creates the image of only one evil chapter in a book full of good chapters. A book of one black chapter in a white book, and likewise a stain on a clean, stainless surface. A stain, maybe unintended, maybe a mistake. Thus the rest, the overall picture of Danish national history, remains stainless and figuratively speaking blameless. Similarly, one black stain seems to appear on a white surface. The book can be closed and the black chapter will be almost invisible. And the stain can be removed in order to uphold the, the national narrative of innocence. The mayor who opened uh, the transfer day event to the public and praised freedom was a member of the nationalistic extreme right Danish People's Party, whose vice president, Søren Espersen, we have him here, and this is also a, a, an ad with the uh, perfect white family with a dog. Um, <clears throat> and he has, he has, uh, Sir Esperson, the vice president, has stated repeatedly uh, that an apology for the colonial atrocities is, ir is irrelevant because descendants of enslaved Africans were better off now as citizens of the U.S. than they would have been in a shack in Ghana. The interesting point here is that the intervention by freedom and the claim to memory seem to be includable and compatible with a politically extreme colonial approach in line with, for, for example, the old right in the US uh, that also perceives slavery as a civilizing gift to the present day African Americans. The contradictory statements can be understood as an example of the flexibility and capacity of racist discourse. The ability to, well, to double talk. 
Um, yes, and then I had something, well, I was carried away, so <laughs> I had another exhibition that I would, um, that where, where um, Freedom was on display, and I will just, it was in the, uh, the Queen's um, part of the Christiansborg, the Parliament, the Christiansborg Castle, and I'll just show you some images, and oh, uh, we have um, Freedom, and we have this, well, very opulent um, building with, oh, with wealth created, um, among others, on the backs of, of enslaved Africans, because the royal family and, and the monarchy in Denmark um, uh, gathered much of their wealth um, out of, of, uh, of the transatlantic slave trade and the, um, yes, and I need to speed up. And the, uh, um, and had, had plantations on St. Croix. So I will just, I'll just um, show you some um, quotes that will illustrate how, well, you can have a, you can have a conversation about black chapters and you can try to, 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 uh, to intervene into the uh, national history. But um, there's also a counter intervention. Um, and, and, and well, the queen, um, she spoke up about um, this colonial past. She was visiting Ghana and she stood um, inside the, uh, the, the Christian um, fort, former, former slave trade um, fort. And, and then she said, well, about the, uh, the, the colonial times. Well, it's not a pretty chapter, but this was in fact what you did around the world, including most European nations. Anyway, those with a large fleet, because you had overseas territories and wanted people to operate them, and they happened to be slaves. <laughs> and on the question of, a, of apology, the queen responds, I think one of the things that one should do is to pay attention to the fact that this was back then, and it is not like that now, and then let it be. One shouldn't look at history with one's own spectacles because it gives a very good view of reality. So, and there's, there are, yeah, um, I think I'll skip this. And, um, <laughs> because I need, to, I need to, to, uh, to also to talk about the cracks, the interventions, it's not, all about closure of this uh, discussion about the colonial past in uh, Denmark. There are uh, uh, cracks and interventions as well. And one of, of the huge one is um, I'm Queen Mary, that Lavon will talk about um, after my presentation. So I'll, I will not say much about that, um, but I will um, say something about Fireburn. Because um, you, can, you can tell uh, histories from different angles and perspectives, and uh, a history of, of the Virgin Islands under Danish colonial rule is also a, a history of resistance and rebellion. The uh, St. John insurrection in, in 1733 is one of the earliest and most successful revolts against slavery in the Caribbean, and also 18, um, the 1848 revolt in St. Croix led to abolition of slavery. However, slavery was replaced in 1849 with repressive unfair rules and control of farm workers. The pay was low, mobility was restricted, conditions were harsh. And 1st of October, 1878, on St. Croix, the farm workers finally had it and they rebelled and burned down many plantations, opened up great houses and chased planters out. Queen Mary was one of the leaders in Fireburn, but not the only one. Um, after, after Fireburn, and I think I will just skip this as well. After Fireburn, there was a trial. Um, there was 400 people arrested, and 40, um, 12 of, of them were um, put to a, to a court-martial and sentenced to death and executed immediately in the, in the, um, the 5th of October, and, and 40 people were brought to trial that ran over two years um, and, and eight of them were sentenced to, to hard labor in Copenhagen and, and transferred to, to um, uh, well, four of them were, were transferred to, 
uh, prison, the women's prison in Copenhagen, and three to another, uh, the men, three men to another prison in, in Jutland. So, um, this, um, this uh, history was documented in, or the, the trial was documented, the inter, uh, interrogations, the police reports, everything was um, documented in, in the Danish colonial archives. And the trial was, well, well one of, of, of the injustices was that the, the, um, um, all the documents were in Danish and people were questioned in English, but they were not able to, to read or to follow the sentences themselves. Um, the colonial archives in, in Denmark were brought to, as, as, as Tammy said, was uh, brought to Denmark after the sale. Um, so, well, as, as um, Jeanette Bastian write in her book, um, well, the Virgin Island kind of lost its, its memory because the archives were, were stolen. And this um, brings me to, well, the fire, I'm approaching the, the Fire Bonfires <laughs> project <laughs> because um, in, in, in dealing with archives, Bastian um, underlines that there are three principles. There are ownership, custody, and access. Um, and of course, it's, it's very difficult for people on the Virgin Islands to access archives in Copenhagen. Um, so, so the Fireburn Files project is very much about access to these archives. And, in, and, and still, well, now they have been digitized. And as Tammy also said, that doesn't help very much because it, they are written in, in, old, in handwritten in old, English, in old Danish. Um, so it's, it, it, it's still an, an inaccessible um, archive. And now we have the, the Fireburn Files project coming up. Um, because the Fireburn Files, Fireburn Files project is um, a kind of activism where you as, um, well, a white privileged Dane um, criticize then and again um, how things are going in in, the, in Denmark and how the institutions are not living up to uh, a, well, English spoken dialogue, not doing anything about translating or, um, and the, the historians are still uh, working in, in the Danish language. So what can we do? We have to do something ourselves. So um, one thing is to, 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 to start this project, which is about um, giving well access through transcribing and translating um, documents in the archives on the Fireburn. Um, and that's, um, that is about, well, uh, between, well, 1,000 to, to, uh, to 1,500 pages, so it's a lot of work. Um, and it's also about gathering different kind of historical sources uh, in order to, 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 st to start a conversation on what happened in, in the Fireburn and, 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 and how was this documented and what is the perspective of creating these archives. It's not about, it's not about well, uh, uh, finding the ultimate truth about the past and about Fireburn, but it's, it's an attempt to facilitate the creation of a shared platform um, for access accessible historical sources, both written and oral. It, the oral histories and performances are very important as well. It's not only about the, colo uh, the colonizers, um, documents and, and archives, and, and the platform for, well, for dialogue, interpretations, accounts, and explorations in the understanding around Fireburn. Um, it's a, so far, it's 100% activism around, um, well, I started this, at the 1st of October um, 2018. So it has been, well, we have been working for a, a year now. And, um, and well, around 30 archival activists have been engaged this year in transcribing and translating documents. And the process will continue for a long time, I guess. And a test version is just, has just been well finished and um, I cannot, it hasn't, well, the, the platform hasn't been published yet, but I have some screen dumps in order to show you, give you an imp uh, impression of, of, of what the, the, the project will uh, contain. So this is, um, yeah, we have 
stolen a <laughs> screen dump <laughs> job from from uh, one of the videos in my in my film called Tiffany. Um, there's a section of, of documents um, from um, relating to to uh, to uh, to Fireburn. There's a database of persons involved in the trials, um, but also others, including the Danish um, gendarmes, police officers, judges, um, local people involved in the in the in, in the fire burn. And there's a section on on oil history, um, which um, will be should be um, produced and 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 um, and created on the islands, um, videos, uh, sound bites. And, um, and, and performances, um, so you can see how, um, how, how reenactment or theater play or lyrics or uh, music um, <laughs> um, is, is uh, illustrating the fire burn. Um, so this is, this, well, this is some of, of the documents, um, the trial protocol, the commission's protocol, and you can you can you can see well from the from the final sentences you can you can for example see um, uh, the the uh, the fantasy of the white people um, of well it 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 goes uh, again and again in 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 the, the in the documents that that the the Danes are very afraid that this is a revolt and it it's about killing and uh, all the white people so. Um, this is this is the judge saying, well, even though this this is the idea of a Negro revolt, there are no signs that that the firebun actually was about killing all the white people, and um, yeah, that's we'll skip that. And um, and you can also see how gender um, is 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 uh, or or the or the non-compliance with. Um, with a traditional gender construct is a factor in the way the, 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 uh, the detained are described. This is a very, um, uh, this is about Agnes and, 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 uh, and she's said to have her head wrapped up like a man and a stick in her hand, whereby a witness whom already had watching her on, uh, had been watching her on the country road while the Negroes were de debating whether or not they should walk into Carlton, even with strong description, um, describes her excitement. He ha she had a, a gunpowder bottle in her hand and poured gunpowder in her mouth, after which she wanted to have some rum and shouted that if she today would meet any white man's child, it had to be killed. When then John Christian came, she danced with him in the front. So you can see this is the, uh, Image or the construction of the of the uh, wild, violent um, black woman. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm wrapping up. So just to have to <laughs> show you have prison records that um, uh, well, some of the of, of, of the material in in this uh, platform is not a part of the digitized documents. So we are gathering everything. And here's a database with all the names, um, news clippings from uh, uh, contemporary uh, newspapers. New York Times wrote about the uh, the, uh, the fire burn and and described it as a uh, as a labor revolt. Um, the uh, the performances, the reenactments here, um, the videos uh, on uh, uh, school videos, performances on uh, the fire burn, and um, uh, a research. Uh, well, different documents, uh, scholarly documents, statements, manifest, contemporary accounts about the, the fire burn. So, yes. Um, well, my, 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 my final two lines will be that it's, um, it's there's, there's, there's so much work to be done. So even if we had a 2017 with a lot of exhibitions and discussions, um, looking back now, the, the tendency is to close all these discussions and openings. So um, you have to, well, you have to realize that, <laughs> that it's, not, it's not an easy job and it's, it's a powerful discourse to, 
to, to, to try to counter, and that's a lot of work to do, and, and hopefully this will um, help keeping the, uh, the discussion alive. So thank you very much. Good night. <laughs> I know that confused with like, good night, wait, are you leaving? No, that's just how we say <laughs> hello in the Virgin Islands. So I'd like to first thank um, the organizers of this event, thank Elizabeth, thank Tammy, Pamela, thank all the people at BCRW. Um, it's been such a pleasure to be affiliated and to be a fellow for the last year. Um, and because of that, actually, I've shifted some of my presentation because I've talked a few times um, at the university this year. Um, so when Hella said, well, if she's gonna talk all about I Am Queen Mary, I feel so bad because I'm like, actually, I didn't plan on talking about it because I have so much. Um, but of course, in the questions, you know, we can, of course, talk a little bit more about monuments and how it relates to archives. Um, what I wanted to do um, was speak first about um, this new project that I'm working on. Um, I've been working on it for about a year. It's a book project, and um, it's called Ledgers from a Lost Kingdom. It's titled after um, an exhibition that I did in 2017 at that transfer. And I'd like to read to you some sections of it um, to open and to close, and then I'll talk about some of the other work that I do as a, as a visual artist in between. Um, so to quote Jeanette Bastian, um, on March 31st, 1917, a small group of islands in the Caribbean began losing its memory. On that day, the three islands of the Danish West Indies, St. Thomas, St. Croix, and St. John were transferred from Denmark to the United States and renamed the United States Virgin Islands. So this is good. We live in the ruins of a lost kingdom, of a spectral landscape haunted by its own imperial beauty and despoliation, where the past is persistently and disturbingly present. This past present is evinced in the names of our towns after Danish monarchs, the towering sugar mills etched into the landscape, the forts whose, face, the forts whose cannons face outwards, even though it is our inwards that has been besieged. The vandalism is marked on our bodies, in our names, in our ability to name and remember. It's true, the process of losing one's memory is an insidiously violent one. Even more surreptitious is the fact that we have forgotten how we came to forget, how we lost our ability to recollect, how we became a culture of decay. There are those who say it began in 1917, when the Danes, upon the sale and transfer of their colonial island possessions, sent their archivists to retrieve the records of what they had done. The fact that they took the artifacts of the indigenous populations existing way before their distinct arrival is not besides the point. It is exactly the point, a remarkable point of view that engenders a particular entitlement revealing how stories like these unfold. There was a discussion with the new owner, the United States, about what records should remain in the Caribbean for legal and property right uses. However, as was often the case, Virgin Islanders were not a part of this process yet the import and impact would surely be felt. There was a fragmentation of the archives. Although most would be sent to Denmark, some were placed in the United States mainland, some were placed, um, they, some were placed in the United States mainland. What would this dislocation from the context where the archives were created mean? More importantly, what would the lack of access both in language and in distance mean for our process of becoming? It would mean that we live in the fragments and all that this conspires and inspires. It would mean that our ability to image and imagine would become our greatest weapon in forming counter archives to the ones that were lost. For even though Denmark has prided itself in keeping some of the most expansive records in the transatlantic slave trade, there is still much that has been lost because in essence, the archives are transactional. It images the colonies as trade posts viewed through an economic prism of value and exchange in which lives get consumed, cultures absorbed, and certain kinds of knowledge erased. Yet and still, a ledger provides a unique system of retelling, of reconciling the accounts, of evaluating what was gained and what was lost. It is from this framework that I approach the colonial archives. Through the materiality of the architecture, the furniture, the photographs, the documents, I challenge their objective authority. I work to expose the absences 
and imbalances and conspire to create new archives in which our subjectivity, agency, and interiority become a part of the currency. The fact that we are now named the Virgin Islands of the United States is a contradiction on every level, for one cannot be virgin and be possessed. One cannot speak for democracy and imbue empire. Yet and still, in our seemingly inescapable state of liminality, we struggle to define and belong to ourselves. We seek to develop our own currencies and our own visual and narrative tender that will move beyond the value of colonial nostalgia and the Pinterest and capture the imaginary of connectivity, multiplicity, and marronage. So with that, um, I'm gonna show you some of my, my work in attempting to do this. In 2008, I had the first um, opportunity to go to Denmark. Um, I was invited to, as an artist, to kind of think about, you know, in the Virgin Islands, we have so many visual reminders of this colonial period, so much of the architecture, um, et cetera, and the people, I mean, everything. And I was curious if Denmark had that. So I spent a lot of time those first two months just walking. And I didn't find much. Um, as Hella talked about, there isn't a lot of visual reminders um, unless you know specifically what to look for. Um, but I stumbled into this store called the Royal Copenhagen. Um, in that store on the third floor, there was a museum space that had uh, floor to ceiling um, plates that went all the way back to the 1700s. And at that moment, I realized that I was looking at Cheney. Cheney are these fragments of colonial pottery that um, we find everywhere in the Virgin Islands, on the beaches, um, they resurface after hard rain. If you live in any historic property, which is pretty much everywhere, um, you'll often find them. So I had asked, um, so at that moment I realized, well, I'm actually looking at a full, these full complete plates. At the time, I thought maybe there must be some plates that deal with the Virgin Islands. So I asked the curator of the museum, they didn't know. In the meanwhile, I had engaged with the head curator online, um, and I had done my own research. I found a series of plates that the Royal Copenhagen did have that did reference the Virgin Islands. That interaction online with the head curator taught me so much and has led so much of the direction of my work. So the response was, um, I asked, you know, could I see the plates? I'm looking at them on eBay. They're really small. I'm a visual artist. I'd, I'd like to kind of engage with them in a more um, profound way. And I was, he told me no. I was, so first I was denied access, which is often what happens. That we've, we've had this kind of consistent denial of access to the archives. The second thing is that there was a, a contrast on how I interpreted one of the plates. Um, one of them, which is what you could see here, was of this famous ship, the Jutland, which is a famous Danish ship. It's um, because of the maritime novelty at, at the time. And in their records, it was not included in what they had considered anything that dealt with the Virgin Islands. They had a very specific way that they categorized everything. But for me, the last time that ship, when I did my own research, the last time that ship sailed in the Virgin Islands was when the Danish king was making the decision on whether or not to sell us. So I thought, that makes sense, it, it connects to us in some way. But that interaction taught me, you know, his kind of denial of my interpretation taught me that we will have different responses when we engage with these records, and that whose response is more valid, whose interpretation is more valid, whose story is more valid. And so in many ways it set me on this path to try to create counter archives and also to find the silences in the archives and try to, to either fill those spaces um, with my work. So in this case, with this work, Collectible, um, what I had done was with these, you know, the Royal Copenhagen is one of the most luxurious um, and renowned brands of porcelain products. What I had done was I had transferred the images onto paper plates, and as we can imagine, what do we do with paper plates? We use them and we discard them. And I felt that that really commented on um, our relationship, not just as colonies, but also what was happening with the record and the memory. <clears throat> so here's another one. Um, I often also work with, you know, as I mentioned, the material artifacts, so both here with Cheney or with stones. Now these stones are, you know, I had this interaction in my studio where I was thinking about, you know, I, I found these stones, they were, um, 
remnants. I, I have a property that's from the 1700s where my studio is located. And I was really curious why these stones, first of all, were even there. Um, I had this memory of uh, reading or hearing this memory um, about the enslaved being sent into the ocean to cut these coral stones out of the ocean, that these were used in all the foundations of the building, but here I'm finding them as ruins on my property. Um, and I thought that these, you know, I looked at them and it, I mean, they're beautiful objects. They looked almost like these ready-mades, but also that they had their hand. It was like an archive to their work. Um, so, as I said, a lot of my work, it, um, it deals with kind of thinking about these fragments and, and piecing them together to create something new. So here, with the stones, I recreated them as a plinth. Um, the work is called Trading Post, and it was very much trying to signal this process of, um, when we think about the architecture in the Virgin Islands, like the first image I showed of the, that yellow building, which is our government house, we often see those buildings as Danish buildings because the Danish brick is on top and that's the architecture that we, how we define that architecture. And we often forget the labor of the people who built them. But here, what I find interesting is through the ruins of that building and, and the foundation, there was both a physical and symbolic foundation of the wealth of these societies, which is the labor of these enslaved Africans. So that's what I was trying to highlight here. And on the work on the left, thinking about um, I developed a series of paintings where I was taking those same um, fragments of colonial pottery and re-piecing them together, very much thinking about the process of Caribbean identity and how we don't have the full, we have fragments of our African identity and our European identities and our indigenous identities and we kind of piece them together. Um, so you'll see in those paintings that there's kind of like a, a disjointedness sometimes. They're not done in this like beautiful composition. It's more thinking like what does this fragment and how do I piece them together? It's very much used, it's an imaginative process. Um, I also work a lot with the photographs. There's so many photographs. Um, and the first time that I visited Denmark in 2008, uh, PhD researcher invited me to see her project where she was working with a lot of the family albums that were donated to the National Archives. Um, and this image just bowled me over looking at this, it was actually a postcard image that was circulated and you see them in many of the albums of this uh, uh, child alone with no parent and crying. And I couldn't understand why was this image, re, like why was it circulated, but it made me think about my own family albums um, and so what I did is a series of work where I juxtapose images from the uh, public Danish records, the Danish colonial archives with my, um, my own personal archives. You know, in this one, I'm thinking a little bit about, uh, I'm using some of the language of the records and shifting them a bit and kind of placing them with the photographs. So this one is called St. Croix Pickney, Danish West Indies, DWI. And this is an image of myself called St. Croix Pickney USVI where it's kind of ambiguous. If I'm crying or laughing, it's not so sure. And it's very much also a commentary on our current colonial relationship with the United States. Um, here are some other images with um, contrasting images of my mother and thinking about class and gender issues um, and all the signifiers that you can see in both of these images. Here is um, contrasting an image from the archives with um, of, of what's called in the archive actually as an obia man, but that's a word in the Caribbean. It's kind of a disparaging word to talk about any African derived spiritual practices. Um, and then here's my father who was a Moravian priest, which was a colonial missionary uh, church in the Caribbean. Um, and just kind of looking at the differences even in the way that they present themselves and just thinking about those narratives of, of what has happened. <clears throat> And then finally, here's another image. Um, I find the text really interesting. I'm gonna read that briefly. It's called, um, School Children, Their Forefathers Were Slaves. They Are Learning to Be Useful Citizens. And this was, came out of a book, um, not so much in the, it, it came out of a book actually of a Virgin Islander from a Danish family. Um, and there's a few of them who've written these very nostalgic books about their families. Um, and then it's contrasting this image of myself um, that was taken actually in Wisconsin. Um, but I remember because I was the only 
white, I was the only black child in that space, that there was a, a, a particular imaging of me that reminded me of this um, imaging from the colonial archive. Um, and I'm going to end with uh, newer work that I did this earlier this year. Um, you know, a lot of times, so this work that I've done with the photographs, a lot of times I felt like, how can I penetrate them? Like I wanna punch them or something. Like they're these images, they have this incredible power. You know, there was one way for me to kind of juxtapose my images and I thought that was an interesting way. But in, in this work, it's a digital work that was commissioned um, by a project out of the University of um, Copenhagen. And what I'm doing is kind of using text as a way to interrogate the image. Um, and then the images are also manipulated. I change them and wrap them around to look like, I mean, they look like many things. They can look like a black hole. They can look like the evil eye protection symbol that you see throughout the Caribbean, or I mean, actually other parts in the world use it um, to kind of protect yourself from evil. And it's the, the piece is called How to Survive Colonial Nostalgia. Beauty seizes you in the flesh. It dulls the senses, infects memory, but it is the only place left, the only place to gather, the only possibility. How does one create a separation of time and space and then wrap them back around each other anew, like a vestibule, like an island, like the call and response? Did you stare long enough into the abyss to notice it stares back, seizes you in the flesh? For what has not been born from we being on our knees? Unassigned to antiquity, their bodies circulate in voided lands, a locus, the only possibility. All right, thank you very much. Hello, good night. Um, I had an image that I was gonna have up there of um, Tammy and myself um, in the archives. I'll, we could flash it for a moment. But the image that I think I actually want to use is from Hella's presentation, because um, it was a great image. It, you had an image in there um, where you had all the three queens, their, their names, and then actual pictures, pictures of the archive. Could you pull that up for us, for me? The work that I'm doing is actually responding directly to those um, archival images, so I thought it would be cool to have them up. Thank you. Um, I'm not a techie kind of person, so the fact that I have like my phone and this and my computer up here is gonna be a little bit of a disaster. Um, but I'm glad to be here. Thank you to Dr. Navarro um, and to Eve uh, for helping make this a possibility. Um, and it is an incredible honor to be sharing the stage again with these three amazing women. As uh, both Tommy and Hella referred to um, in the beginning of their presentations, we all met three years ago in Denmark. Um, and Dr. Navarro, Levon Bell, myself, and uh, another woman, um, Dr. Hadia Sower, are part of a collective that's called the Virgin Island Studies Collective that actually was um, brainchild during that time. Um, and Hella was a really key part of that. And we do work about the Virgin Islands, trying to recover our our lost, lost narratives, um, but also trying to create new narratives about the Virgin Islands. I'm going to uh, read to you a poem that I wrote with these archives. And in part, I wrote this poem um, in response to archival work that the Virgin Islands Studies Collective did with the archives of the, the four queens that were involved in the fire burn that, um, that Hella's work on the fire burn 
project is, is referencing. This is such a cool project that you're doing, Hella. I'm so excited about it. Um, so I'm just gonna read a poem. The poem is actually pretty long, or it's long for me anyway. Um, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about my process in the poem, and then I'm going to um, read the poem again. And I'm doing that in part, I never, poets never are supposed to give away all their secrets as to how we're doing it and what we're doing, but I thought that it would be interesting um, for you guys to hear like, what I'm referencing and what my process was. So I'm not gonna talk about the process much, I'm just gonna read the poem, then talk about process, and then see how maybe your knowledge about that process might um, impact your receiving of the poem in the second time around. Okay. The poem is called, I See You. Queen Mary wore her rings when she burnt buildings down, burnt the St. Croix cane in her gold hoops. My aunt bought me a pair of earrings once. No, that's not true. My aunt took them out of her own heirs and gave them to me. Don't tell my mother, she said. But Queen Susanna told Queen Matilda, don't forget your necklaces when we go burning. If we get took, we have to look our best. The Danes will make us process in shackles, but if we have our bangles gold, our people will see us know, know their queens. Always paint your nails or leave them blanched. Make sure your lipstick goes to the corners of your mouth. You are a queen, my aunt told me, no matter what they say. My aunt ran the queen pageants on St. Croix, had royalty in her blood. Her mother had been carnival queen, her brother had been prince, my aunt. I am speaking of the aunt who never left me out of the family pictures, the aunt who called me whenever there was a marriage or a baby born, the one who made sure I got a Christmas present, same as the other granddaughters, stole her own mother's wallet to make sure she never left me out, never left me, never left, never. Queen Mary beat her boys, which was illegal, just as it was illegal for a black woman to wear lace or tulle, beating the boy was the same as wearing the sexiness of lace. Here was a black woman who could whip your man in at least two ways. Every white woman's greatest fear. My aunt cursed me out once, more than once, and I took it because she was the one who loved me. Your mother is worse crazy than me, my aunt said. At least, she said, I raised my own children. She was good at this, my aunt, getting me to my weakest point and shackling me there. Take these bangles, she said, they're gold. A machete can be a pendant, a torch can curl up the arm, a glowing bracelet, a noose we all know, a necklace a noose laced with silver, something my aunt would have worn, but no, she did it by gun. When the queens are found, they are in the archive. They are in Danish, they are in Denmark. Their bodies, sometimes ill, sometimes adorned in gold, come through my silver computer screen. They are translated by pixel, by English, by various impossible translations of time. In the archive, there is a letter, Queen Agnes writing, asking her aunt to write her, accept my apologies, Agnes asks. I'm sorry, my aunt said. For what, I said because there are so many things my aunt should be sorry for and because I have already forgiven her all the things. For it all, she said, but on the phone and a new mother, I couldn't translate her, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The milk in my breast was the only transmutation I could manage. I am trying to tell what it might be to be a beautiful island woman, mad, beautiful and mad, and how you could go, say, to Denmark to die for murdering a white man, but still make sure to take your gold earrings so that they are there in the archives for me, a hundred years later to find and claim and wear as my own. I am trying to tell what it might be to be a beautiful island woman, mad, 
beautiful and mad, and how you could go, say, to the United States to die, to murder yourself in front of the white man who was your husband, and make sure to do it so that there are no earlobes for earrings, no lips for lipstick. A gun to the head leaves nothing beautiful, nothing beautiful to bury, so we had to burn her, my aunt. Here you can see how I named the historical Crucian queens, the ones who killed so we could be free, how I can't name my aunt, how I can't name how any woman makes herself a myth. That was my first time reading that out loud ever. <laughs> um, so I grew up in libraries. My mother and grandmother were both uh, librarians. And libraries, of course, are archives of their own. Um, but I also grew up in the Virgin Islands where we were living quite as, as Levon um, described in these old places. Um, and we were walking around and celebrating and getting married and um, linemen hanging out in places that were you know, hundreds of years old. Um, so we were also living amongst archives. And being curious was I think a big part of my childhood as it was for many children, but just digging through things and finding and discovering um, was a big part of how I grew up. Um, my grandmother's rule in the house was if you could read it, you could read it. So you know, if you were able to read it, you were allowed to read it. So I was constantly digging through things and uncovering things, letters about my family. Um, one of the things I began to be interested in with the archives was not finding like things that were exciting or things that were fascinating and new and would up end our way of thinking about history, but things that were actually mundane and might help us get to understand something about um, the deep humanity of the, these historical and mythical figures that we were looking at. Um, and we've come to understand that at least there were four queens of the fire burn. They were the leaders who led this labor revolt. Um, and they were sentenced to death, although it, there, we, we believe that that was um, trans, was not, ended up being hard labor for life. But there's not a whole lot of evidence as to what happened to them, how they died, um, if they were shipped back to the Virgin Islands, if they died in Denmark. Um, and when we, the four of us who were investigating the archives, the four of us in the VI Studies Collective, um, we, all four of us are women, and one of the things that we discovered pretty quickly was that all of the queens, although they cut cane for a living, although they had um, been arrested for revolt and for murder, they, although they had been taken across the Atlantic Ocean from St. Croix to Denmark and had been in jail, um, they, in their archive, they had their jewelry. Um, they had their, and in their archive it said like her ring, her earrings, and I, we all thought that was pretty fascinating that these, um, these women uh, had these elements of adornment that they carried with them and kept with them. And we in the Virgin Islands call them queens, not because they were aesthetic beauty queens, but because they were leaders. But it got me thinking about um, how they've been imaged in our history, which is often as like these hard face, hard back, tough women. And it got me thinking about um, the fact that they were women and that they were also invested in adornment like most of human beings, not just women, but that they were human beings, um, and that they were human beings who maybe had access to some elements of wealth, but also who were invested in their own beauty and in their own presentation of beauty. Um, so I wrote the poem thinking and trying to tease that out. At the same time, my aunt in real life um, uh, was a beauty queen and ran the pageants in St. Croix, um, and she is very present in St. Croix um, in archival records as this figure of beauty in the Virgin Islands. She was a model in the Virgin Islands. Um, and many of us who, who grew up in the Virgin Islands wore clothes from Java wraps that she modeled. Um, but in the archives, you will, it, there is really no record of how she died, which was by suicide. Um, and she, uh, that, that has been sort of washed out of her out of her life, and if you go, I, and I've, even now that I'm talking to you, I'm refusing to give her name, um, but if we go to, if we look her up, um, there's nothing that says how she died. And in fact, there will be blanks, no record of how, of, of death, of cause of death. Um, and even people in our own family, especially of us, uh, people who are maybe a few years younger than me, um, don't know that she died by suicide, and that's um, intentional. We're trying to 
to, to create her and only present her as this really beautiful figure. And I thought the juxtaposition of her, um, the way that she has entered the archive as a beauty queen, and the way that our queens of the Fireburn have entered the archive are exactly opposite, but I wanted to align them and see what would happen if, we, if, if I aligned them together. Um, so now that I've said that, I'll read the poem one more time and then I'll, I'll, I'll hush. Queen Mary wore her rings when she burnt buildings down, burnt the St. Croix cane in her gold hoops. My aunt bought me a pair of earrings once. No, that's not true. My aunt took them out of her own heirs and gave them to me. Don't tell my mother, she said. But Queen Susanna told Queen Matilde, don't forget your necklaces when we go burning. If we get took, we have to look our best. The Danes will make us process in shackles, but if we have our bangles gold, our people will see us, know, know their queens. Always paint your nails or leave them blanched. Make sure your lipstick goes to the corners of your mouth. You are a queen, my aunt told me that. My aunt ran the queen pageants on St. Croix, had royalty in her blood. Her mother had been carnival queen, her brother had been prince, my aunt. I am speaking of the aunt who never left me out of family pictures, the aunt who called me whenever there was a marriage or a baby born, the one who made sure I got a Christmas present, same as the other granddaughters, stole her own mother's wallet to make sure she never left me out, never left me, never left, never. Queen Mary beat her boys which was illegal, just as it was illegal for a black woman to wear lace or tulle or gold. Beating a boy was the same as wearing the sexiness of lace. Here was a black woman who could whip your man in at least two ways, every white woman's greatest fear. My aunt cursed me out once, more than once, and I took it because she was the one who loved me. Your mother is a worse crazy bitch than me, my aunt said. I forgot the bitch when I read it the first time. At least, she said, I raised my own children. She was good at this, my aunt, getting me to my weakest point and shackling me there. Take these bangles, she said, they're gold. A machete can be a pendant, a torch can curl up the arm, a glowing bracelet, a noose we all know, a necklace, a noose laced with silver, something my aunt would have worn, but no, she did it by gun. When the queens are found, they are in the archive. They are in Danish, they are in Denmark. Their bodies, sometimes ill, sometimes adorned in gold, come through my silver computer screen, they are translated by pixel, by English, by the various impossible translations of time. In the archive, there is a letter. Queen Agnes writes asking her aunt to write her. Accept my apologies, Agnes asks. I'm sorry, my aunt said. For what, I said because there are so many things my aunt should be sorry for and because I have already forgiven her all the things. For it all, she said. But on the phone and a new mother, I couldn't translate her, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. The milk in my breast was the only transmutation I could manage. I am trying to tell what it might be to be a beautiful island woman, mad, beautiful and mad, and how you could go, say, to Denmark to die for murdering a white man, but still make sure to take your gold earrings so that they are there in the archives for me, a hundred years later to find and claim and wear as my own. I am trying to tell what it might be to be a beautiful island woman, mad, beautiful and mad, and how you could go, say, to the United States to die, to murder yourself in front of the white man who is your husband and make sure to do it so that there are no earlobes for earrings, no lips for lipstick. A gun to the head leaves nothing beautiful, nothing beautiful to bury, so we had to burn her, my aunt. Here you can see how I named the historical Crucian queens, the ones who killed so that we could be free, how I can't name my aunt, how I can't name how any woman makes herself a myth. Thank you.
Thank you all for those um, insights and glimpses into your work. It's always such an, an amazing experience to hear from each of you. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot there. Um, I have prepared questions, of course, but I also have questions that have come up um, in hearing what each of you had to say in the various sort of iterations of your work, um, which have, of course, changed over the years. Uh, I think, given what Tiffany just offered us um, through her sort of family archive and her engagement with the colonial archive of the Queens, I'm going to uh, ask you if you can each talk a bit about the role of memory in the archive and maybe some of the memory work. Tiffany, you're working it. Both Tiffany and Lavon are sort of working your familial archives alongside or maybe through the colonial archive. And Hella, you were talking a bit about different kinds of remembering in the f towards the end when you were talking about the fireburn files, the different, the importance for you of having, bless you, a capacious kind of understanding of archival material, right? The oral history, right? Being attentive to the different kinds of memory and wanting to ensure that that's all included um, in this project that you're working on. So I, in whatever register it, it, it sort of makes sense for your work, I'd like to um, just hear you sort of riff on memory and maybe memory work in relation to the archive. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, Uh, it, uh, this was hard, uh, writing this poem was particularly hard for me because my aunt, as I talk about in the poem, was my favorite person in the world. Um, and in a lot of my understanding of aesthetic beauty and what it means to be a lady comes from her. Um, so having to remember her um, and remember her death was incredibly painful. Um, but I also felt like some of the work that we did, and I hope this was clear, that, um, th that the four of us who were engaging with these, the archives and the ones that I had up there, we were each, we each picked a queen, or we each were assigned a queen, and we responded to that archive. But the archive, as I say in the poem, had to be translated. We didn't, we don't speak Danish. Um, and then we engaged actually with that translation. So there were all these kind of distances, not only in time, but also in, in the language, right? So um, in some ways, I also felt like we were inventing a little bit. That part of our work wasn't only remembering, at least with the archives, it was also about us trying to, at least for me, trying to think, think, think our way into that history and figure out what, what, would it, what maybe could it be in a way that, similar to what Levon was saying when she was interacting with the guy from the Royal Copenhagen, and he saw that one plate so differently than you did, we had to think about, like, well, we are black women who may see these archives in a very radically different way than the people who have been holding these archives all these years. Um, and how, how might we enter into that and maybe, in, in my case, have to create new memories um, because the archives are so so spare, so sparse. Um, so a lot of my work was, was inventive, um, just trying to imagine what was possible. Yeah. Um, I've, you know, in so many ways in the Virgin Islands, we've, you know, on the one hand, I opened up by talking about what's like we've lost our memory. So there's so many things that we don't remember, and then other things that we've, like, like memory is really kind of this fiction. Um, you know, when we thought, like, for example, about the, the monument, I Am Queen Mary, um, there were so many, you know, that, that image, and, you know, that you've seen it, <laughs> it was so interesting, and they're like, there she is again. Um, but that image was interpreted so differently in the Virgin Islands. Um, the sculpture now, at this moment, is in um, Copenhagen. But, and it was because of how we, our memories towards both the Queens and also towards um, the fire burn in general. Um, and so there's like this interesting contrast in terms of how, um, like, the making of a myth of this, this queen like we had kind of forgotten that there are so many things that we don't know about her. Like a lot of people didn't even realize that she wasn't from the Virgin Islands. People, it's, it's like just having lack of access to some of these very concrete things about her. We've just created all of these um, other memories. 
Um, and then it's kind of also thinking like which ones are more valid, you know? Is it, is it that important maybe that she um, was originally from Antigua? We see her as our queen, you know? So there's, those are some of the, my original thoughts to that. In terms of the work, in terms of dealing with my own family, um, you know, the process of, of juxtaposition, which was really interesting because Tiffany's work is another kind of juxtaposition. Um, I was really interested in just seeing what happens with when you kind of pair these two memories, because those photographs are both a different kind of memory, and what, when you pair them together, what are the new narratives that come up? So at first it was a very um, investigative process for me. Um, yeah, it was, it, was, it was more about, and, and you know, what I thought what was interesting in listening to you is almost like, uh, like when you see those photographs, you have to have a very particular way of viewing or sometimes you need to have my memory. So what does that mean when you don't know necessarily the whole background to these images, but you just kind of see them together. So I think that just, like those are just some of the contrasts mm -hmm. that I was thinking. So that the viewer has to kind of then create something else, you know? Yeah. Ah. Um, when I um, look out of my kitchen window in Copenhagen, I, um, I can see the apartment where uh, judge Rosenstein, who was a judge um, in the Fireburn trial, where he resided when he returned from St. Croix and, um, and became a well civil servant or judge or whatever uh, in Copenhagen. And um, well, I found out about this by accident, but I, I mention it in order to illustrate the difference in positions because I don't have the colonial history um, as a, well, as a family memory. I uh, relate to, um, to, well, to the stories being told as part of the collective imagined communities and imagined memories of the colonial past. And in, in, uh, in that, um, in that sense, it is a, well, the mechanism I use to, to, to describe how our memory, uh, our national imagination of, of memory of the colonial past is produced is by the uh, repetition-induced, well, memory. The repetition of certain narratives again and again, for example, about the, the, the good colonial master, the governor who emancipated um, the enslaved Africans. And that's, that's a story that has been told again and again. So even though um, the, the archives, the, um, the documents, the colonial records have been in Copenhagen for that many years, it's not, um, it, it doesn't have the consequence that, 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 that the Danish colonial memory is very rich and um, detailed, um, it's, it's also very fragmented, but, um, but governed, I think, um, from a very, um, um, very, well, narrow perspective of again and again uh, producing this, this image, this memory of, of, of the good colonial master in order for um, the, the, well, the white national self to be more at peace with, with ourselves. Um, so I think that that the memory work that we have to do as white privilege uh, Danes are um, need to be an an, an effort, um, and we need to, to find ways to uh, to create counter and archives that you were talking about, um, and 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 also break this. Um, national imagination of our colonial history. And that's not, um, and that's not so easy. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course you could say it's, it's, it's about well the institutional approach and it's about well educational system and, and, and what what, but it's also about the personal uh, memory work that is 
some is very fragmented because we, we don't have the family history to relate to in the same way as if you are, if you are um, descendants from, from enslaved people in, in the, the Caribbean. So it's, it's um, and I think, well, we need, we need, um, we need novels and poems and we need um, <laughs> um, very much um, a, well, memory, work done by others mm -hmm. in order to to uh, be able to uh, to try to understand also our own positions in in the, in, in this colonial history i think um that's part of the reason that i started writing this book um is because you know i did all of this artwork that led me on this path to be in a really unique position where I spent in 2017 half the year in Denmark and half the year in the Virgin Islands, you know, working. And I realized that there's, there were so many things that you don't see in that work. You know, you don't see what it felt like to work at the Royal Copenhagen, um, to be the only black person in the 200 and 50 something year history of that company to ever work there, to ever engage with them. What that felt like on my body to be in a space with white porcelain and white people and this like, <laughs> you know, art objects that cost 300,000 euro and what, what did that and how did that inform me? Um, you don't really get to see that in the production of the work. So I thought it was, and spending so much time in archives made me realize I need to write my own I, I want to write about these experiences. I want to write about what it was like to listen to the Queen of Denmark in our conversation, talk about sleeping on a bed that enslaved Africans meant, and kind of joke about the fact that she, that's why it wasn't in the exhibition. And her not understanding what that means for the current monarch of Denmark to be sleeping on a bed made by enslaved Africans. And, you know, so I, I realized that there is a, I didn't want to be, a part of those silenced voices. And I also wanted to, you know, I had the, the work that I almost showed was an experience of when my narrative had been hijacked. And I also realized how so many times um, when we're looking at the archives, the way that people of African descent are represented are so, there's so much, like, it's not real. Like, we think it's real, it's the archive, but a lot of it is projections and yeah. mistakes and misunderstandings and, 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 um, <laughs> And so I also kind of wanted to create a counter to that as well. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great transition actually be, um, because it's true, Levon, that so often, yeah, that's your seat. <laughs> um, it's true that so often it, it, the archive somehow presents itself as impenetrable or infallible, right? So thinking about the dynamism that you all bring to it, thinking about creating an alternate sort of source of archive or contributing to various um, archives I think is important, and I wanted to ask you all just to say a bit more about that, the role of context and what you called, Hella, in your presentation, interpretation. You were saying that there's these different interpretations on which one is more valuable. Um, Tiffany and Levon, we have talked about the vital importance of context, particularly for Virgin Islands archives. So your plate experience, right, understanding a steamship that came through and decided the fate of these islands as related to the history of the Virgin Islands in your understanding, but in the understanding of this chief curator had nothing whatever to do with the islands, right? So just I want to hear you think about the, the role of context or interpretation in, in the archive. Yeah, I, I, I found the, um, was it the, is it the, the vice president or whoever it was who said what he said about history doesn't matter and, or, or the queen who said something about like, we don't need to, we shouldn't have our modern glasses on history. And that's something that I heard growing up too. Like, oh, we have to forgive the slave master. And probably we've all heard this. Like, we have to look at what it was at the time. Like, given the time, everybody was doing it and nobody knew any better. Like, that's the narrative that I, ha I was taught in, even in high school in the Virgin Islands, um, mostly because my teachers were white Americans. <laughs> um, that, yeah, this was bad, but the people who were doing the bad didn't know how bad it was. Um, and it turns out that that's bullshit. I mean, <laughs> right? It turns out that like that, the archives actually reveal evidence that um, 
you know, slave masters and owners of plantations were very aware of the full humanity of their of the enslaved people. Um, they knew that they fell in love. You know, they knew that they wanted to go have picnics. They knew that they wanted to dance. They knew that they were like as complex as they were, um, but they were constantly just undermining it and 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 trying to hide it from themselves, right? But they also even have people amongst them. We have all this evidence, of course, of people who were abolitionists, even from the very beginning, writing articles like, this thing, slavery thing, is not such a good idea like for our souls. And people were like, eh, nah, nah. I mean, it, we, can, <laughs> we can imagine what it will be like 100 years from now when our great-grandchildren are like, maybe they didn't know how bad climate change really was. And we know that that's bullshit because we all know how bad it really is, right? But we're just ignoring it, like they were doing. So I feel like there's a lot of evidence, like if we hunt it down, that shows that's in the archives. One example um, of, uh, that I can talk to specifically about when we were looking at those articles of the queens um, was, <coughs> it was there was a lot of scarcity in, in the information, but you know there was one thing where it turned out that one of the queens, they were in jail in Copenhagen, one of the queens got sick with the exact same illness as another queen on the exact same day, and they were held in, um, in, the infir in the infirmary for the same amount of time. It was like a headache or something, connected to something else, like headache and sinus or whatever. And I, I thought, oh, they are, they're lying. They're lying so that they can go hang out together or talk to each other to get the, to be together. Now, I'm making that up, but at the same time, like, what is it that they were, had the exact same illness at the exact same time, right? What, is that, what might that mean? Um, there were some other um, notes where one of the queens was indeed writing a letter to somebody who had the same last name as her. And I don't think we even thought of the queens as literate before that. Like, and the fact that, that that she was writing to someone whose husband was a pastor meant that she, uh, this queen who we think of as like these illiterate laborers, you know, who were drunk and, and, and burning down things, that she had connections with people who were powerful in the community. So all of these things were revealing truths that we, even in the Virgin Islands, hadn't really fully considered. Um, so sometimes the archives are, are hiding and sometimes they're also, if the right person is looking at them, mm -hmm. revealing. You can just. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think I think um, I think context is very important, and I think that maybe sometimes context is also at the surface of of the archives. Um, for example, well, very obviously the um, the uh, the taboos um, on the monarchy's role in the transatlantic slave trade in Denmark, uh, well, naming the money, uh, the structural, mm -hmm. the sy uh, systemic um, uh, system of of, of power, um, and and how race is a construct linked to that economic exploitation. I think that I, I know it's 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 <laughs> it's obvious. But it's it's not mm -hmm. because it is constantly um, covered in the, in the, well in in in, in mainstream um, discussions at least in in Denmark. Mm -hmm. So I think that that <laughs> that um, and and it's of course that's in the archives as well. It's it's I think it's uh, really fantastic with the rich archives in Denmark. And the documentation of um, the monarchy's role in and, and wealth created from um, slavery and plantation owning and whatever, um, and, and and that's in the archives, but has been um, hi, uh, hidden mm -hmm. from the Danish um, public, and and that's and that's on the historian. So, so. Um, some of, 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 of the context is so obvious that um, we need to, well, just, just uh, blow the dust off and, uh, and make it a reality so that we can move on in, in the archives um, with, with more detailed knowledge of, of, of how life was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, my brain is racing because there's so many things to talk about. Um, I guess I want to think maybe about future archives and like mm -hmm. the context in which those are being produced. Um, so I am Queen Mary. When we 
were making that monument. That was an artist-driven project. It was me and um, my Danish counterpart, Jeanette Ehlers, who decided to kind of um, push into the public space, try to penetrate this colonial amnesia in, in Denmark. Um, the way that that project had been perceived prior to the inauguration was that, you know, two little black girl artists come in to put some kind, it was, we, we had temporary permission to put a monument up. Um, we were able to get some money, and so we chose, we were able to make it in, um, the top part is actually a material called polystyrene, which is the commercial, or the technical name for the commercial name of styrofoam. So, um, one of the things that we realized because of this desire in Denmark to close this dark chapter that we felt like we were keep trying to pry it open before <laughs> it actually closed, um, our project was trying to keep this conversation going. So one of the things we did was employ a publicist. Um, we did that partly out of, you know, stepping into another genre. I had a friend that was in the music industry that was like, how are you doing this project and no, you don't have a publicist? And I was like, well, artists don't do that. We, we don't do that, you know? But I, as I thought about it more, I realized that this would be an incredibly important political tool to use in our project because both Denmark and the Virgin Islands are not really high prior, they're not like big countries. They're not countries in terms of the global stage that people think about. Um, and I knew that it would be, we knew that we could sense that, you know, this impending closure of that chapter was coming. Mm -hmm. And if we wanted to somehow penetrate that, we had to get the attention of a larger narrative. Like we had to change the narrative. Mm -hmm. So when we worked with a publicist, when we hired this PR company, um, they really helped us to generate an incredible amount of press. I mean, it was talked about in over 100 um, media outlets all over the world. And what that did was it, it created kind of a new archive um, about the fire burn. Um, so because us, cre us doing this monument and then getting, pr like generating all this press around it, now there's hundreds of articles written about a little revolt that happened in an island and a place that most people didn't prior even know about, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So I, and what that did was it kind of shamed Denmark because so much, like we kind of lost control over that archive, of course. Um, so a lot of the reporting was like, Denmark gets a monument, Denmark. And so it made it sound like Denmark is doing this. And so kind of Denmark looked around and was like, um, I guess, <laughs> okay, I guess we need to do it. I guess we need to do it. <laughs> so after that happened, we had all these, we had institutions approach us, like how can we help you? Where prior to that, yeah. it was like fighting a, you know, I mean, I'll give you an example. That inauguration, the image that Hella showed, um, out of all those people that were there, it was a deathly cold day. So I think there would have been triple or quadruple more, but no one from the institution that gave us the permission came, except for the guy that was directly working with our project. That speaks a lot. No, they didn't come. So he tells this beautiful story of the, you know, this happened Easter weekend, the Tuesday after Easter, everybody has to give a report, and he has to give a report about this project he was working on with these two artists. And when they see that it was reported in the BBC, The Guardian, The New York Times, Time, I mean, they, they were shocked. They were like, what the hell did we miss? Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, the context of, um, you know, being able to kind of create, how do, you, how do you begin to create new archives and kind of project them into the future, I think is something that I'm really curious about right now. It, it's not just about looking back, it's like being very, very aware of the work that you're doing and how they can become reinterpreted or transformed and, um, and how you can use art um, and just narrative in general mm -hmm. as a, a really powerful tool. Thank you. So we're getting close to running out of time. So I'm going to ask one final question and then open it up. Um, it's interesting how you just ended, Lavon. You said we can't just be backward looking, right? And so much of the work and collaboration that we began really came in that moment of 2017 because of all the funding and political 
opportunities that came into being around that commemoration. Um, so anyway, my question is one of, of now, of the present, right? So neither the past nor the future. Um, so many of you will have heard that um, your president, Donald Trump, uh, president. would like to purchase Greenland, um, yeah. which as it turns out is not for sale, as it's part of the Kingdom of Denmark. Um, so I guess I, that's sort of a foil, but I want to ask you to discuss the ongoing significance of archival and decolonial work that you each do for the current moment, because I think there's a lot of myopia, unawareness perhaps, um, but there's also something else, right? I think that there's also um, other things going on that you could maybe speak to through your work of the significance of this decolonial work, which can, I think, sometimes be placed to something past tense, um, and I think we have all experienced how important it is for both the present and the future. So I guess I want to hear you talk about the ongoing significance. All of you, hello, this, this is an emergent project, right? The Fireburn Files, it's coming into being now. Um, so thinking about this work and why it matters now. Um, well, as, as I said, I, I hope that the Fireburn Files project can um, continue to keep that, keep a small crack in the, in what is closing in the, in Denmark, um, and um, and also continue a a, a transatlantic uh, collaboration on the project. Um, the ambition with the the project is that it is handed over to a institution um, that can that can continue to maintain it it's it's a hundred percent activist project right now mm -hmm. um, but the um, well um, I think that that the um, if this project will succeed and if it will also um, result in it is a production of the oral histories um, uh, of um, uh, well new narratives old narratives family stories about fire burn it will represent something new um, and um, and the ownership um, will I hope um, be in the, uh, the the US Virgin Island for mm. well for good now uh, well when we have finished the translation and and use the competences we have in, in well, the, uh, in, in bridging between Danish and English, um, well, then um, I think that the project will develop by um, gathering the oral histories and the performances and the artistic expressions around uh, the Fireburn Fire so that it will be a developing archive, and I hope so. It will help with some funding and some institutional <laughs> anchoring, but 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 that's uh, that's the ambition of and and but it, I hope that it will be um, a factor in in Denmark as well, where people will go to this uh, new archive to get knowledge about um, the colonial history, the Danish colonial history as well. Um, yeah. Small ambition. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh, you know, this is something I think about so much. Um, how to begin? Um, you know, in the opening statement that I read, it's so vital to our process of who we are. Um, to be, do this work. Um, and I'll give you an example. So the inauguration of I Am Queen Mary, it's this amazing experience. I come back home and it's in the middle of Virgin Islands History Month, just ended. And I walk through my children's schools and on every, in the entire hallway are colored images of sugar mills. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like a reproducible, a worksheet that so many of the teachers to talk about Virgin Islands history had the children draw sugar mills. Now sugar mills are these conical structures. They look like a cone with something tapped off. And um, they had these rolling pins on the inside. There was someone's job who was to have a, 
a machete so he could cut off the arm of someone who inevitably would always get their hands stuck as they were pushing the sugar cane through. These are violent torture symbols. Like they're, but we as Virgin Islanders have completely, they're, they're like filled with this nostalgia. Mm -hmm. We actually see them almost as a symbol of who we are. That is very painful to me as an artist. I felt like I was doing all this work in Denmark <laughs> and here we have a lot of work to do ourselves in terms of our own decolonial process and how do we begin to change the symbols that we have for ourselves. So um, it's, it's a, and part of it is because we don't know the history. You know, a lot of people don't, like it's very, like you could be at a beach and see one of these sugar mills be at a, my children's soccer game and look up and see one. I mean, they're everywhere. And so what, did, what has happened to us to have to live in this kind of symbolic violence is that we don't remember, right? And so it's like, or we, or we remember in different ways. Like it's this, it's like the process of trauma. And so a lot of, I feel like a lot of this archival work is healing work in many ways. It's kind of reshaping these stories and, and finding new symbols and creating new narratives from this incredibly painful history. And I think, um, um, you know, it's not, it's Hella mentioning, it's not easy work, it's hard work. I mean, it's, it's uh, I think it's important work. Don't just pass anything. another mic. It's, a, it's <laughs> optional. <you know? laughs> I'm laughing at Levon who keeps passing us her mic. Um, it is symbolic <laughs> you're sharing. Um, as a Virgin Islander who was a reader growing up in the Virgin Islands, if you wanted to read about, if you wanted to read a novel um, set and based in the Virgin Islands and based on the Virgin Islands, you inevitably were reading a novel that was written by someone who was not from the Virgin Islands. Um, who hadn't even lived in the Virgin Islands, um, except for maybe a year or so as a sort of, in a sort of touristic kind of way. Um, so I grew up reading things that were about us, but not written by people who were invested in us. And in fact, for even into my adulthood, and maybe this is the case still now, if you go to the bookstores in the Virgin Islands, often these books are the ones at the front for the, so the, for the tourists, or even for us. Um, if you go into the tourist shops, these are the books that are in the front also. Um, and that's what tourists would buy to get a taste of the Virgin Islands. And that's often what we were reading too. Mm -hmm. And then we would also, similar to the sugar mills, we would also say, yeah, yeah, that's how it is in the Virgin Islands, yeah, yeah. Even though it's not how it is, but it's, <laughs> it was the only narrative that we really had even about ourselves, which is pretty much what it means to be colonized, right? Um, is to only know yourself via the lens of the colonizer. Um, and so when I wrote my first novel, Land of Love and Drowning, I wrote that novel completely in response to those existing narratives, which I felt were like, the, in some ways, I, I didn't think I had this language at the time, but they were, the, were, they were our fictional archives. They were the archives of what it would mean to be a Virgin Islander, were these other novels by people whose names I'm sort of intentionally not saying, but also I tend to forget the people who I don't want to think about and talk about, so I can't even remember who the, what the names are now. Some dead white dudes. Um, so, like, you know, I wrote, I read those books, was horrified by them, and then I took the characters that were the main characters in those books, and I made them the minor characters in my book. And I took their minor characters, characters who sometimes were unnamed, or if they were named, they only had, they were named once. Um, and I made them the main characters in my novel. So I sort of flipped it um, and talked back and tried to make those people become real and fully human. And I think that's the work that we're trying to do, mm -hmm. right? Is say that, like that's the decolonial work, is say that we are fully human um, and that we deserve to be primary in our own narratives. Um, Phyllis Whitley, who was, I hope you guys know this, but I'll say it anyway, was an um, enslaved African here in the United States who was also like a world famous poet. Um, she has all these letters that sometimes we don't really pay attention to, but are in, her, are in the archives, in her papers. And there's a professor at Hampshire College whose name is Tyra Bynum, and sh her work is not about Phyllis Wheatley's poems, but only about the archival work, including the papers that Wheatley has left behind. And one of the things that we find in Wheatley's archive, because many people think that she was performing the poetry in part for the, for the gaze of the white master and the Europeans who were buying her books and kind of helping her have a sort of 
far freedom because she was a famous poet. She could kind of go, even though she remained enslaved, um, she had a bit more um, access to things because of these poems. So there's a lot of argument that the poems themselves are not really a good access to her, but that the letters and fragments she left behind are. And there are these amaz amazing <coughs> fragments where she has things like, um, I mentioned that the slave masters knew you wanted to go on a picnic in part because she has a records where she and her friends are requesting from the slave master, can we go on a picnic? Um, and we're gonna spend this amount of money, and we're gonna buy a pig, and we're gonna only go this far, and, um, and my male friend is gonna bring this person. And here is a list of all, and here is how all the couples that are coming together. And you realize that these are people who are just, li they, wanna they wanna go on a picnic. You know, they just wanna have a real, regular, they wanna, ha they wanna find joy in their everyday life. They are all enslaved people who have to request their joy. Um, but just the fact that they were seeking joy tells us that they were fully human. And I feel like that's the work that we're doing, right? They're saying that these people were fully human, um, even though a lot of the narratives we have of enslaved people is of the suffering, as we should have those narratives, those narratives often continue the dehumanizing um, vision of enslaved people. And I want us to create narratives that just create, you know, these are fully human people. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the work that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. So please help me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>